Hey guys, my name is Laszlo and today I'm going to take a look at our most popular interior design decor style videos on our channel and match each of these looks with the works and styles of classic illustrators from the past centuries. I know it's a bit meta, but it's actually very simple. To give you an example, I think if you're into cottage core as a design aesthetic, chances are you're also going to love the artworks of Beatrix Potter. That sort of thing. Mixing and matching decor with art. Okay, makes sense. You ready? Let's do it. Now I'm obviously biased when I say this, but I do think we don't give illustration as a medium the credit it deserves. As opposed to fine art, which is quite a prominent part of art and design education, some of it general knowledge even, illustrators of the past just never really reached that status. Meaning you might have heard of a couple of my upcoming examples, but I can guarantee that you will see some incredible art in the upcoming minutes that you have never seen before. Okay? Let's keep it on theme and start with the cottage core style that I already have mentioned. The look and feel of traditional cottages and the slow, intentional living vibes they project became a hot topic of recent years. For obvious reasons, as the world as we knew it had to be put on hold for a bit. And this idea of olden day living and traditional decor provided some much needed escapism from all the bad stuff that was going on for a lot of us. I already mentioned the works of author and illustrator Beatrix Potter, a very obvious example whose work goes very well with this sort of style. But if she is a bit too obvious of a choice for you, maybe take a look at this lesser known artist called Janet Laura Scott. Janet was an American illustrator and landscape artist who left behind an incredible portfolio of charming little greeting cards, baby books and children's book illustrations, which if you love anything vintage and cottagey, could be right up your alley. She mainly worked with watercolors and gouache in this charmingly innocent style. Big blocks of flat colors, not a lot of shading, not a lot of line work even. In her character work she liked to rely on these striking block print resembling shapes to carry her paintings. It is also a typical style mark of hers to use these bold, oftentimes unusual color combinations to create striking contrasts between her characters and the background. She really wasn't afraid of color. These harsh, almost glowing yellows, for example, are quite unique and instantly recognizable of her style. If you decide to look her up, note that once she got married, she became known as Janet Scott Barry. Later in life, besides her name, her style also changed a little bit. She adopted a more conventional way of using watercolors and in her later years dropped commercial illustration altogether and taken up landscape painting full time. Her work in print is a pretty rare sight these days, but if you're lucky enough you might stumble upon a vintage children's book in a second hand shop or on places like Etsy, her work sometimes shows up as well. In which case as a cottage aesthetic lover, well, you, you have hit gold. Now if Janet's work is not your cup of tea, as alternatives I could recommend you to take a look at the artwork of Jerry Pinkney, an artist of more recent times who made these more conventionally coloured but incredibly detailed watercolour paintings. Or, if you're more of a classic person, look at Ernest Howard Shepard's sketches, an absolute icon of the industry who illustrated classics like Winnie the Pooh or The Wind in the Willows. Ok, let's switch gears and take a look at the witchy cottage aesthetic. This video that Jacqueline put together about this style has gotten over 4000 of you subscribing to our channel so far. Now currently, at the time of me recording this video, we are sitting around 52,000 subscribers. Meaning 1 in 13 of you decided to join our little creative crew based on nothing else but this video alone, which is quite remarkable. And yes, I know, 1 in 13 of you. Spooky. To pair this style up with an artist, I would like to introduce you to one of the greatest of all time, an English illustrator called Arthur Rackham. Now if you take nothing else from this video, this is a name I would like you to remember, because the guy is an absolute illustration legend. I have yet to meet any living illustrator today who wouldn't cite Rackham as an inspiration. And for good reason, I mean, just look at his work. He would establish his scenes using pen and ink for his rich line work, then color them in with layers and layers of these beautifully washed out watercolors. 
As you can see, every nook, every corner is filled with beautifully inked lines. His scenes are so full of life, full of character and fun, whimsical detail. What always strikes me in his folio is how good he was at composing his images. Even the sections without line work or layers of color, the negative space feels very intentional and well thought out. I think it's fair to call Rackham one of the first true celebrities in this industry, whose efforts really helped to establish the so-called golden age of illustration. If you ever hear people talking about the golden age of illustration, what they refer to is that Roughly 50 or so year long period, usually counting from the 1880s and going strong until the 1920s, 1930s, when this particular style of illustration has just become incredibly popular. The reason behind that wasn't just the artistic excellence that was active at the time. Mind you, the artwork of this period is fantastic. But also, by this time period in history, the printing tools used to replicate and mass produce copies of the artworks finally became sophisticated enough to give you a pretty good representation, a pretty good copy of what the artist actually imagined. For the first time, it actually felt like you're looking at hand drawn illustration work when you bought one of these books or magazines. Rackham's great sense of the fantastic and fairy tales just worked so well. I believe that if you enjoy a witchy decor aesthetic, you can find tremendous amount of beauty and joy going through his folio of work. I know I do. To not leave you without an alternative, I would also recommend you to take a look at the monochrome engravings and illustration work of this French artist from the century before Rackham called Gustave Doré. Now his portfolio is much less whimsical and of a more serious tone. He oftentimes illustrated mythological and biblical scenes, generally creating a much more melancholic and darker atmosphere. For me, this could be very well described as esoteric or witch-like. But it also segues into my next style, where we are matching art with the aesthetic known as dark academia. From a visual point of view, for me at least, there are some overlaps between the witchy style and this other style that we call dark academia. A lot of illustrators' art could work well with both styles. What I think the key separator could be here is the subject matter. Dark Academia projects a more studious, more serious vibe, so for this one I would drop the fairy tales and focus on art that depicts more classic literature that was aimed at a mature audience. Or again, depictions of biblical or mythological themes, which also would work well. An artist I would refer to here is another English gentleman called Aubrey Beardsley. Aubrey was a key figure in the art movement in the late 1800s that we refer to as aestheticism or the aesthetic art movement. I know these days we use this word to describe anything and everything under the sun, that's kind of the inspiration behind this whole video. But back in the day, aesthetic art was this new idea that sometimes you can make art just for art's sake and not every creation has to carry some life-changingly deep meaning. Some art can exist just to entertain and to be pretty. The point of this was to shake up this otherwise very rigid, very traditional Victorian idea of noble art. Other key figures, like the writer Oscar Wilde, was wholeheartedly supporting this movement by the way. All art is quite useless, as he famously says in his book. What stands out in Beardsley's work is the precision he was able to achieve with his ink drawings. I haven't had the chance to see them in real life yet, but those who did say that in the originals there is literally no signs of any underdrawings, no pencil marks, no visual planning at all. It is all super clean, perfect inking work. He cited Japanese woodcuts as his main source of inspiration, and as you observe his style marks, you can also tell how his work influenced a whole new artistic movement that later became what we call Art Nouveau. I especially enjoy the drawings he made to illustrate the King Arthur Excalibur legend, so if you want to dive deeper into his work, definitely give that a look. Or if you think this is all a little bit too simple, I would also lead your attention to the surreal prince of Dutch artists, Maurice Cornelis Esser. Quite mind-bending stuff, as you can see. The type of art that definitely holds people's attention and just wants to be stared at. Now, after all this doom and gloom, I say let's brighten things up a little bit and talk about French country vibes. 
This is a style that is obviously very different from the previous ones and you know what, I'm not gonna beat around the bush here. Fine art might work better to match this decor aesthetic as opposed to illustration in most cases, but if fine art is just not your thing, then I'd introduce you to a French illustrator to match your French country loving vibes. A lady called Adèle Anaïs Toudouz. Adèle was working as a fashion plate illustrator in the mid 1800s. Before the age of fashion photography, there was a time when illustration was used to visualize fashion and garment design. Meaning 200 or so years ago, fashion magazines used to look a lot less like this and much more like this. The idea with these illustrated magazines was, besides providing aspirational high fashion concepts which are just nice to look at, the ladies of Victorian times could actually take these fashionable garment illustrations to their local dressmakers and tailors to actually get them made, in a time when every piece of clothing had to be handmade anyway, of course. Doing fashion plates for magazines was a prominent source of steady work for female illustrators at the time, and so Adele spent quite a bit of her career doing this type of work. She's known for working with the particularly popular Parisian magazine called La Mode Illustrée, a weekly publication that became successful on the back of the very simple concept of targeting the middle and working classes with their content, instead of catering only for the super wealthy, like most other magazines. In terms of her style and technique, she's using etchings for her line work, etched onto wooden and metal plates, then colors in her images by hand to get this, at the time very modern, but now incredibly nostalgic artworks, with this classic turn of the century feel. Now, if Victorian fashion is just not your style, I would also recommend you to take a look at Pierre-Joseph Redoute's botanical illustrations. Or James Tissot's work. Both of them, I think, encapsulate very different, but equally illustrious sides of the French country style. And last but not least, let's take a look at art with a coastal decor vibe, which is also a very popular type of content that you guys like to come to our channel for. To me, I gotta say, this coastal beachy look is the odd one out of the style assembly to some extent, because I believe this is a style that really doesn't require artwork made by someone famous or grandiose to match with. Here in the UK there are hundreds, if not thousands of unknown artists out there selling their art in and around coastal towns, and I imagine that's the case in most countries around the world. So in case you wanted to decorate with this sort of thing, my prime recommendation would be to support coastal art scenes by strolling around some beach markets, little seaside shops and get yourself some nautical sea-inspired art this way. But to keep us on subject, of course I have a recommendation that we could take a look at. I would like to bring in front of you American illustrator N.C. Wyatt's work. Neville Converse Wyatt's name might ring familiar to many of you as we are talking about one of the greatest figures of American illustration, who has made artwork for many, many classic novels we all know. I wouldn't say he's a typical example of a coastal artist per se, and yet I always think of him when I think of illustrations inspired by great waters. He has given us countless seascapes and ocean scenes, and what I really like about his body of work is that all of these interpretations feel accurate as to what live water is like, but at the same time they all look and feel very, very different. He's not afraid to show this versatility, Water can be cool and calm at times, a true ally, but it can also be an awesome, frightening power that demands respect. Sometimes it's only there as a clue to frame an image, like on this scene for Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, which is one of my favorite illustrations of all time, if I'm honest. I don't know how he came up with this bright yellow sky and the black line of sea, but it works incredibly well to create a very distinctive scene of this gang of pirates, ready to dig up treasure. Not a hint of blue on this image, but somehow, at least for me, it feels very much like a coastal scene. But of course, all of this is subjective, so yeah, I'll be very curious to hear what you guys think. You know, here at the Dentier and Balloch headquarters, at the DMB HQ, we are very well aware that this channel of ours, with the open themes of art, design and decor, 
is quite broad, at least from an algorithmic point of view. Oftentimes it feels like this is actually two channels in one, as the content that I'm making here is very different to the content that Jacqueline is making. And while we're never really going to change that, because at the end of the day we are just different people, and we want to always show you different creative things to keep the content interesting, here and there we're going to attempt to widen the middle part of this content Venn diagram of ours, which is my very roundabout way of saying that here and there I will try my best to make content for you guys who came in for the home decor stuff that Jacqueline is making. Does that make sense? If it does and you like what we are doing, feel free to join the creative crew if you haven't done so already, interact with the content to keep the channel going and yeah, I'll hope to see some of you again once I get another random burst of creative inspiration. Okay, cool. Until then, I'll see you later. Ciao.